Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, Astra made the 10th launch of their company's history. They were launching a pair of satellites for NASA as part of the Tropics constellation, and the orbital requirements made the Tropics mission especially suited to Astra's small-scale launch vehicle. They were going to make three launches of two satellites each. The previous launch that Astra had carried out for NASA was Ilana 41, and that had unfortunately suffered a failure during the stage separation. Thankfully, that didn't prove to be a problem this time. There was a clean fairing separation, then a clean spacecraft separation, and it proceeded onwards to orbit. However, once it got to within about a minute of reaching orbital velocity, the engine shut down in a big puff of uh, vapor, and then the vehicle was seen to start spinning out of control, bringing the mission to a premature end and sending the spacecraft back into the atmosphere. It didn't have enough velocity to stay in orbit. We're not sure whether it had just enough speed to get all the way across the Atlantic. Uh, obviously, we have a very limited set of telemetry to work from, and we don't actually know the coordinate system, so we are basically guessing. But we do know that it's six and a half kilometers per second. The satellites and the upper stage would not have survived re-entry. So that means nobody is going to charge NASA for littering, but it also means that NASA isn't going to get all their cool science that we're going to expect from this. So Tropics is an acronym. It stands for Time Resolved Observations of Precipitation Structure and Tartan Storm Intensity with a Constellation of Small Sats. Yeah, a constellation of six CubeSats. So these are small 3U CubeSat. What do I mean by that? Well, a U in CubeSat speak is basically a cube which is 10 centimeters or four inches in a cube. And so the Tropic satellites are made of a 2U bus and a 1U spinning micro microwave radiometer. What that's doing is it's scanning the surface as well. It's scanning the atmosphere of the Earth passively in microwave ranges, starting down at about 90 gigahertz and going all the way up to 206 gigahertz. This multiband scanner is able to collect information from inside the atmosphere on uh, like temperature, precipitation, moisture, uh, you know, all the important stuff that drives or, or defines what a storm is. So it's not only able to do this at very high speed on its own, but because there's multiple spacecraft, they are able to return to the same storm multiple times in the day and therefore get very high cadence information from very close to where the storm is happening. This is, you know, really good if you want to understand how hurricanes happen. Now, since these are interested in hurricanes, they didn't need to, them to be in very high inclination orbits like many weather satellites. These were going to go into 30 degree inclination orbits. They would launch them two at a time and each of them would get a single orbital plane with the satellite staggered so that they would revisit uh, a certain you know, time apart. Now, this is a variation, or this is a change from the original design of the mission, which would have had them all launch into a single a single orbital plane from a single launch. And this is where Astra's small launch vehicle, in theory, shines for them, because it can put these things into separate orbits rather than having them all in a single orbital plane and reducing the area which this constellation can cover. So it definitely made sense for NASA to go with Astra as a launch provider for this mission. It's a very low cost mission. Like I think the hardware and launch services is something like $20 million in total. But you know, right now, I'm kind of hoping that they built some spares or some test objects because they've just lost two of them. And while the Constellation can work with just four, Ideally, it would be nice to have six or, or more if the if the costs or the money can be found. So anyway, that's what the mission was supposed to do. That's not what happened. And I expect a lot of you are tuning in to find out my take, what I think happened. What can I tell from the meager amount of evidence available? And frankly, it's not a lot. So Astra have their rocket factory in Alameda, California, in the, the old Navy base. The rocket that they build is small enough to fit into a standard 
45-foot shipping container, which means they can basically stick that on the back of a truck and drive it across the country without any, you know, flag cars ahead and behind of it like you would have with a much bigger rocket. Yeah, th this was a nice, small, compact design that is designed for rapid setup and use. They uh, you know, shared some nice footage showing the hot fire test to demonstrate that the rocket was in fact ready to launch. Of course, getting up off the pad is something that hasn't always been a 100%, but um, you know, we were hopeful that the problems had been solved. But the problem they'd had on their last NASA launch had of course been the fairing separation issue. Here's a comparison between launch 7 and launch 8, showing the fairings failing to detach until the engine fires and blows them off. For launch 9, this problem had been solved. This was a ride share carrying satellites for a bunch of companies, including Swarm Technologies, which is now owned by SpaceX. So Astra does have the distinction of launching satellites for SpaceX. And for today's mission, the, everything seemed to mostly go well. There was a hold early on, some concerns about weather, but they launched and headed skyward and they got through the stage separation. As far as I can tell, there wasn't anything obvious going wrong uh, earlier in the flight. So the launch broadcast was done in collaboration with NASASpaceflight.com and they, they've been actually doing this for the last few attempts. It's been you know, great, they do good coverage. Now, the only thing that was problematic was the velocity and the attitude telemetry, or altitude telemetry was kind of slow in updating, but that is actually not that unusual for Astra. In fact, if you look at launch 9, the velocity updates, it would go like you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds sometimes before the velocity got updated. But we could see that it was accelerating and climbing towards its target altitude of 550 kilometers. And about a minute before it got there, that's when the engine decided to quit in this like puff of, va of you know, vapor. And the vehicle begins to rotate uh, out of control, losing attitude. And that's actually to be expected. If you imagine you're steering a rocket, you're making adjustments for any deviation from the, the exact course. As soon as the engine stops firing, it's just going to start spinning in whatever last state it was in. So it's not unusual that it spun out of attitude after the propulsion was lost. So yeah, if I actually take uh, the onboard camera footage and just play it a little faster, you can see that it kind of wobbles around quite a bit. In fact, some people suggest that it may have been wobbling a whole lot more than it was supposed to. I'm not convinced by that because it doesn't seem that particularly outrageous compared to other spacecraft. But you know, it's possible it contributed. The low frame rate makes it hard to tell if there's anything, uh, any clues in the video. I will say that what I do see is uh, some red and orange bits, and that would imply to me that there's a lot of fuel in there rather than a lot of oxidizer. And seeing that kind of glow outside of the engine ball bell is kind of unusual because usually the combustion is happening inside the engine bell and it's the gas is just expanding out and looking cold and dark in the vacuum of space. Now we can compare it to the shutdown from this previous mission, which is taken under different lighting conditions and therefore different camera exposure, but it shows that the shutdown isn't nearly as, well, it doesn't produce as big a cloud or as flare as the one we saw today. So if the camera had its exposure turned up because it was in the dark, you would have expected to see the cloud even more. The fact that the cloud here is smaller than the other one strongly suggests to me that something with the engine shut down was definitely not right. The other thing I kind of want to mention is that if you look at the velocity and the altitude numbers as this thing is going up, it's actually still going upwards at a very high rate. This is supposed to get into a circular orbit at 550 kilometers. At this point, it is still going upwards at about 800 meters per second. And if you do the math, the force of gravity alone isn't going to stop it. This actually is going to shoot past 550 kilometers and into a higher orbit unless it actually turns its rocket engine and or orients the whole spacecraft to start pointing itself downwards. And we actually saw this happen on previous missions. So it's not like the guidance is wrong. It's just part of the mission design that as they approach their altitude, they point the nose down and try to stick to that and get themselves into a circular orbit. Now, I don't know how, you know, how much maneuvering it actually does. It's possible that maybe the wobbling and the maneuvering somehow just, 
jiggles the fuel around or sloshes the fuel around, I guess is the technical term, and somehow excessive fuel slosh leads to starvation in the rocket engine. I'm not actually convinced by that, however, because the colour of the flame would therefore would suggest that the oxygen was the thing that had the flow disrupted. But if you look at the upper stage design of the Astro rocket, there's two fuel, two propellant tanks, with the oxygen tank, the larger one, sitting in the middle, and the fuel tank sitting on top. And as a complete amateur, I would actually expect the top tank to be sloshier because it's further away from the center of mass. Another thing worth considering is that an earlier launch from NASA, uh, sorry, Astra failed to reach orbit by you know very small margin, and the reason they gave was that the fuel mixture was not correct in the second stage, and so they didn't develop quite this. They didn't get quite the same specific impulse they needed, therefore they didn't make orbit. Now. I don't think that happened in this case, or at least I don't think that was a, a, enough of a factor, simply because the margin by which they were short was a few hundred meters per second, whereas in this case they were like one kilometer per second short. Also, they addressed that on the previous design by basically stretching the first stage and making it bigger so that when the second stage started up, it had uh, you know, a little more velocity already added to it. Also, this was a pretty small payload compared to some of their previous ones. So anyway, I don't think it was a, a propellant starvation. I don't think the shutdown was normal, and that would imply then that there was an engine failure of some sort. But this is a simple pressure-fed engine. I didn't see any obvious debris flying out of it. So yeah, not really clear what's happening there. What I do know, however, is I took the velocities and uh, that was from that telemetry, plugged them all into a spreadsheet like a nerd, and figured out that when the engine shut down that it was probably going about 800 meters per second vertical velocity, uh, about 600, 6500 laterally, and from that velocity, it would take about uh, five minutes to actually reach the apogee at about 630 kilometers, roughly speaking. It's anywhere from 600 to 650 is my guess. Uh, it would then take like, oh, a whole lot longer to actually fall back. I mean, we're talking like a complete mission duration of about over 20, 23 minutes before this thing piles into the atmosphere just off the coast of Africa and burns up. So I hope that Astra has better telemetry than me and actually has a clue about what went wrong here. Uh, they're going to have to figure that out. There are two other launches that are part of the Tropics program and I really hope they figure it out and launch those other payloads because Astra really needs to get some regular launches going on and not failing. Like it's had basically of the last four launches, two have failed. And while they've got this larger rocket in development, they really need to make this one fly with some reliability so that the customers are actually interested in working with them, you know, risking their satellites on this small launch vehicle. NASA, you know, has an interest in cultivating many, many rocket companies. So in this case, it makes sense. But I think that even NASA is going to have its limits after, you know, both of the missions that they have launched on Astra so far have essentially ended in failure. Personally, I think that NASA should maybe just lean into the idea of micro constellations like this and just basically provide enough money to build multiple spacecraft and launch them until they get the numbers worked out. That would be the best outcome all around. Once you start building a significant number of satellites, the cost per satellite drops quite a lot. I'm pretty sure that NASA could find the money to build and fly a whole other set of tropics just by, you know, digging around behind the couch on SLS. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.